Now, welcome everyone to our program, Beyond the Buzz, upcoming releases and how we select them. If everyone could mute um, yourselves at this point, if you have any questions through the process of the program, go ahead and put them into chat and we'll keep track of what's in there. If we can address them during the presentation, we'll do so. Otherwise, we'll do them at the Q&A session that's at the end. So I'd like to welcome you or welcome all of our uh, presenters. We have Ian Cole, Division Director of Technical Operations for the Library System and our nonfiction print selector. Peggy Bircher is our adults material selector and Bethany Richardson is our youth material selector. So I'm going to mute myself and they can start the program. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, I am Diane, as uh, Sharon indicated. And for today's session, we're going to be framing this more as a Q&A, um, even though uh, as selectors, each of us does many of the same things just for a different uh, area of the collection, fiction, nonfiction, youth. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and start from that direction. And a question that we normally get asked very frequently is, what is it that selectors do? Um, so an overview of that role is we are responsible for choosing or selecting, hence the very creative selector name. Um, we're in ch charge of choosing um, books and other materials that meet the informational, recreational, and educational needs of our community. Uh, and we do this uh, in various formats. We do this within budget. And we do this while responding to direct community requests as well. And we do strive to ensure uh, both a diverse collection to match our community uh, and to ensure multiple points of view on a particular topic are represented. And there's a tenet in, in education about mirrors, doors, and windows, uh, creating a representative a curriculum in schools or collection in a library's case. And as selectors, we do our best to choose materials that not only reflect our community, the mirrors part, uh, but also provide a window into others' experience um, and doorways into other worlds. Uh, another aspect of our role is we have fiduciary responsibility um, in to spend taxpayers' um, dollars responsibly. Um, so we start each year with a budget for specific areas of the collection, um, be it adult, nonfiction, ebooks, children's picture books, fiction, audiobooks, et cetera. Um, and we have to pretty much stick to that budget and um, do all of the above while being responsible. Um, did I miss anything that our audience should know, Peggy or Bethany? No, I don't think so. Okay. Um, well, in that case, Bethany, what are some of the ways that you learn about titles? So we've got a few streams of information that we keep track of as selectors. So one of those streams is a very important one to us, and it is suggestions from customers. So we keep track of our customer suggestions that come in through the suggest a title form. So if you are ever interested in suggesting a book that you have not been able to find in our catalog, please check out the didn't find it drop down on the catalog homepage and there you'll see the option for the suggested title form and you can let us know um, the information about about books that you're interested in. So from our customers we get about 7,500 suggestions per year through that form and so we we check all of those out we we see what sort of reviews those materials have um, and and we evaluate them all very seriously. And our customers have really great suggestions. Um, there have been some that hadn't quite hit our radar yet, and then they turn out to be award winners or starred reviews or really, you know, excellent, excellent titles. So everyone in our community has, has excellent taste and we love to know what you're interested in. Um, and we also have similar suggestions coming to us from our staff members. So all of, all of our library staff have another internal form that they can suggest titles to us through. And so we, we keep an eye on those and we really appreciate all of their professional input as well. So in addition to those two streams of suggestions, we have kind of a flooding river of other sources of information. So we hear things from our 
our vendors um, who definitely want us to purchase materials, um, but they do a really good job of compiling things for us and um, giving us suggestions. And then through some of our vendor websites, we're able to look at a lot of reviews. So we use professional reviews from sources like Booklist, Library Journal, Kirkus, Publishers Weekly, um, School Library Journal, which is one that I look at a lot, um, as well as Hornbook and Voya, which are some for children's and teen materials. Um, and then we also use reviews from Amazon and Goodreads. So if somebody suggests a title that maybe hasn't had any professional reviews yet, that does not mean it's not worthy of adding to the collection. We just have to do a little bit more digging to get the information. So we will look at those um, reviews on, on Amazon and Goodreads and uh, take the one star reviews with a grain of salt because maybe somebody ordered the wrong book or maybe somebody you know, thought the print was too small, but uh, we, we sort through those and, and have been able to get good information from, from those types of reviews as well. Um, and then we also look at a lot of sources, all types of sources online. Um, so blogs, social media, for example, I follow various authors and um, bloggers and illustrators on Instagram. That's my favorite social media. Um, but we all look at different sources. Um, for example, Diane really enjoys listening to podcasts and is active on Twitter. So she finds a lot of great things there. Um, so that's a few for me. Um, let's, let's go to Peggy. What other sources do you rely on, Peggy? I'm firmly convinced that today's news is tomorrow's novel, hopefully novel, but occasionally nonfiction. Um, so I look at different CBS, NBC, and anything is grist for the mill, Washington Post. Um, because as I said, I just found a book today, um, Girl A is the title, that's gonna, is based on a new story. And as soon as you read what it's about, you'll recognize the story, I'm sure. Observation of readers and natural uh, habitats. I have been known to casually observe what people are reading on, oh, say the Metro. Um, I've been known to stroll past the new book section when people, when customers are able to come in um, and just kind of casually notice what, what's catching their eye. Um, publisher marketing and emails and alerts, we get them by the ton. Um, and they're very, very helpful. Um, advanced readers copies, which are copies that a publisher sent out pre-publication. Um, for fiction, they're, they're great. Nonfiction, maybe not so much, although Diane could speak to that because it, in the case of, for example, cookbooks, they're not gonna have the color plates. And those are very helpful in depending on the subject matter to see. But advanced readers copies, um, I have been known to pass some on to people and make them read it because I can't quite decide about a book and uh, see what, get a second opinion. And we share a lot. Um, we all look at different things, as we said. So if I see something in a, somewhere that, that I think might be of interest to Diane or Bethany, we pass it along and then you do with it as you wish. But um, at least it's another source of, of things. And we all have a good eye to what, as to what does well with our customers. So it's very helpful, especially when they find things that um, I've missed in my travels. So Diane, okay, we've decided what we're going to get. How do we decide how many copies to buy? Uh, it's an art and a science. Um, um, and it's different depending on the collection area as well. Uh, nonfiction doesn't tend to circulate quite as well as say, some of the fiction um, on, on the whole. Um, th of course, they're the runaways, um, either of the Obama books, educated, um, you know, a lot of narrative nonfiction does really well, and we tend to buy more copies of those. Um, but uh, I also look at things like what's the subject coverage in the collection, and how long do I want something to stay in the collection um, based on our weeding guidelines and based on kind of the, 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 the insights that this particular material might bring to that subject area. Um, somebody who brings something new to the game, you're gonna wanna get extra copies versus somebody who is basically saying similar things slightly differently and maybe kind of a, an updated version of something that is just 
relatively known. It's not bringing something new to somebody who's already um, familiar with that particular area of, of the collection, say. Um, we, we also look at, I look at demand for the, and performance of an author within our community based on some of the, their, their previous titles, if we have it. I look at how much has the vendor bought, which um, that's a pretty good indicator of what the industry itself thinks is going to be happening with this book. Um, so, so it does get a bit trickier, therefore, with um, debut authors or authors from maybe marginalized communities or historically marginalized communities because they don't get as much play in publication. And so we have to dig a bit deeper on those and balance that um, as well. It's, um, again, looking at the coverage and does it fill a gap um, that may not have already been covered within our community. Um, and we look at, as you had indicated earlier, the reviews. I particularly look at two and four star reviews um, instead of one and five, um, because usually there's a reason that somebody gave it a two. That means they probably gave it some depth of thought, but mm, still wasn't floating their boat for, for reasons. Um, and some of the four star reviews, it might be well, it wasn't for me, but let me tell you all the good things about it for readers who might like this other author. Uh, so you can find some really interesting uh, gems in the two and the four, because the reason somebody gives something a two, you know, might be exactly the thing that would float your boat. So um, that's also uh, kind of interesting. Um, a lot of times we'll start with a small quantity and buy more if, if needed. Um, and there are, there are various triggers for that. Um, speaking of which, uh, Bethany, do you want to, uh, actually, no, Peggy, because you do fiction. Can you talk a little bit more about once these books are in the system, how do you know when to add copies? You tend to have a lot more of that very quickly. Um, we monitor a report called the Purchase Alert. And we this is a report we receive weekly and it alerts us to titles with holds. It covers a range of titles and basically serves two purposes. It alerts us to new titles with holds that are building and older titles with holds whose numbers may be diminishing in the collection, and but there's still interest in, and there's still a need for the title. So we look at that and, and evaluate. It's easier for me because um, fiction doesn't generally go out of date. Well, it sort of does, but not exactly, not the same, certainly the same way as nonfiction. Um, so that is that is a big report that I look at every week um, because it's invaluable, especially for things where if it's a new, a new author and I wasn't really sure how it was going to do, I always tell staff we can't unbuy things. So I, I will start small and then this is the report that says, well, you made a good decision with getting the title. You might have made a little better decision with getting more of the title, more copies. So that's a report that I use. Bethany? Yep, so we use that report. And um, we also keep an eye out with all of the, the news and blogs and information sources that we track. We monitor publicity for potential demand. Um, so one example for that would be if there's an upcoming movie or TV adaptation. So, you know, we usually every so often will get, you know, look at lists from, from BuzzFeed or, you know, various sources like that of, of books that are coming out this year in movie form. Um, so this year, of course, Netflix has been especially big in driving demand. So shows like Bridgerton, Salt, Fat, Acid, Heat, and To All the Boys I've Loved Before, those we've seen spikes in demand because of the uh, popularity of the Netflix show. And one that I am already starting to see some spike in demand for, even though the, um, the show isn't coming mm -hmm. out until I believe April, is Shadow and Bone, which is a, one of my favorite YA fantasy series. So I am, I am very excited for the Netflix adaptation to come out. Um, so those are things that we keep an eye on. And sometimes those will let us preempt the demand before it even hits the purchase alert. 
Um, so we also check out, you know, if there's going to be an author appearance on television or radio. So we know we've got a lot of avid NPR listeners in this area. So if somebody is chatting about their book with Kojo Namdi, then we're going to try to make sure that we have some copies of that book um, and enough to meet the demand. And then there can also be, you know, really, really oddball outliers that come from viral videos. For example, I don't know if any of you all saw the, the video of a Scottish grandma cracking up while reading The Wonky Donkey to her grandchild, her infant grandchild. Um, she was just, you know, laughing her head off at this picture book and it showed up on that purchase alert list. Um, and I had actually never heard of that one until then, um, but we got so many people who wanted to read The Wonky Donkey for themselves that it ended up, um, you know, driving demand to get some extra copies. And then sometimes those viral videos can turn into book deals. So they might not have a book that um, there's demand for right at that moment, but later on they will, uh, they will get a deal and publish something. Um, I think actually if this should be a pretty good break point to answer a couple of the questions that came up in chat. Mm -hmm. I just noticed those. Um, so I think we've got we've we've got a couple of spare minutes till our, our next um, scheduled time. So one of the questions in chat um, was about do we go back and buy more copies of a book, which which was um, part of our talking points. So excellent yeah. question. And another um, time that we might do that is at the end or beginning during award season. We might go back and if it wins the award, go back and purchase more of those. I just did some of that today, to be yep. perfectly honest. Same here. Yeah, the uh, the Newberry and Caldecott and other youth media awards were announced this morning. So I've been putting extra copies of those on lists. Yep. Um, so then the next question we had was, how do you decide on the format? Um, for example, ebook or e-audio, print book, large print, etc. cetera. Um, so I'll take a, a quick stab at that and then let Peggy and, and Diane go. Um, typically print, the print book is where we'll start. Um, and, then, and then from there, kind of look at whether, what sort of demand we're anticipating as well as what, um, you know, what the reviews are indicating its, its um, appeal and quality is. So um, for me also with, with youth materials um, for, for digital, I really want to try to, to increase representation like Diane was talking about. Um, so our, our digital collection is still, you know, comparatively much smaller than our print because it's, it's younger. The collection hasn't been around as long digitally. Um, so I'll, I'll try to really make sure that I'm being selective in, in providing representation when I go for other formats. Um, Peggy, do you want to jump in for, for some of that one, deciding on, on formats to get? You're muted, Peggy. Sorry, I went backwards. Um, it all depends on, on availability, and that's a, a big driving factor. Um, for example, people ask for things, and I always feel sad um, in large print, and I, and I feel as if I'm neglecting them, but some things simply just don't appear in large print. Um, so it, it, availability is really the biggest driving factor. Um, and I'm sorry, that's my cat. I apologize. She's aging and she's loud. Um, so that's the biggest thing for me, I would say, is availability. Somewhat similar to me because not a lot of um, what people consider as traditional nonfiction um, is available on audio. Um, you know, not a lot of, say, recipe books type things um, or art books, etc. They don't lend themselves to that format uh, for audio. Um, when it comes to e, though, um, it a lot of that in. Um, Nonfiction is driven, you know, we'll tend to buy more narrative nonfiction in E or the more popular items or things that we can't get in large print, we might get in E format because while it's not like necessarily the uh, a perfect substitute, you can 
you know, change the print size. Look, <laughs> I know I had to do that during the pandemic when I couldn't get new glasses. Um, but you change the um, the font size to to enlarge it, and and it makes it easier because, you know, eBooks don't care how long they are; they just flow like water, you know, to fill whatever bucket you need. Um, yeah, so that's that's kind of one of the ways we choose um, between e or print. And as Bethany said, a lot of things start print. Um, well, one of the other major factors in that is, you know, print versus e-materials. There's a lot of differences in those, um, you know, we'll look at the patterns of what people are reading and those patterns really changed in 2020 uh, because of the pandemic. Obviously a lot of things went digital. Um, but one of the major differences between print and digital are the cost differences. So one of the other things that we have to look at is where are we in our budget? How many copies are we going to need to buy? How are we gonna deal with that, et cetera? Um, and then we go from there. Because um, talking about the cost differences, um, for instance, the, the book, The Institute by Stephen King, the ebook for that is $59 um, and the print was $16 and 32 cents discounted from 30. So we got a major discount on the print, but we don't get that same discount in E. Um, and the costs are not the same as you would see in retail. So while something might cost you, the consumer, um, you know, the retail consumer say maybe $24 or $13 for an ebook or an e audio or even, you know, Kindle Unlimited, um, we don't get those same type of discounts um, in the digital world. Our our copies are sixty dollars because we lend them more than the one time, and the model was built differently for libraries. Um, and in e. Believe it or not, having a holds ratio over six to one is rare, um, but a little less rare this year. Um, and it's always on the books you're looking for, of course, because, you know, that's that's what builds it. Um, so there is a certain point where we can no longer responsibly spend money on one particular title in one particular format. Um, and we have to literally just cap it at either an amount spent or at a number of copies. And we do try to find other ways, um, such as what we did with introducing the Lucky Day collection. Because um, the reason that this can happen with the price differences is unlike print, um, digital does not fall under the Copyright Act. Um, instead, they're treated as software, which means that they cannot be donated to the library. And also unlike print, um, the first sale doctrine does not apply. And that's what allows us as a library to lend print um, repeatedly without infringing on copyright. So that doesn't count in the e-world. Um, so I think that really went a little inside baseball on that, but uh, you know, good, good to know um, that is truly behind behind the buzz. Even library people aren't as familiar with that. So, um. okay. Diane, let me just hop in real quick here. Sure. Um, there's a few questions that I think we'll come, we're so, we will circle back to um, in our Q&A period. Um, but one that was very relevant to the ebook discussion um, was somebody asked if there is a way to donate money to help cover the ebook costs. Um, and so thank you. Thank you so much for asking that question. Um, we are always thrilled to, to have some extra funds to, to help. Um, and if folks you know, are, are earmarking it for, for ebook, we, are, we definitely can use it there. Um, so Diane, you wanna give a little nuts and bolts there? Um, I can give you some nuts and bolts. Um, that can, you can donate to the library directly and you can direct that to go toward ebooks. Um, but one of the things that I can't really talk about is an initiative that I'm getting ready to work on with our foundation regarding um, ebooks. So keep an eye out for that in the coming months. Um, it's not here yet and it's not ready for prime time, 
but um, there are some things that we are looking at doing. Um, and somebody did ask, are there any lobbying efforts to change ebook statuses? I could do a whole thing on that. There are a few initiatives starting and I am active in that community now. All right, thanks. I think we can, can carry on. Keep, okay. The script then. <laughs> Um, so ebooks, those are some of the challenges, uh, um, but Peggy, there are other challenge areas that don't have to do necessarily with e, e versus print. Um, what kind of other challenges do you face? Format availability for classics, believe it or not. Um, you would think that there's always going to be copies of Pride and Prejudice and, you know, some such things out there, but a lot of them are now print on demand copies, which are not a terrible thing. I don't mean that, except that um, for some titles, they are facsimile editions, which means that they are facsimiles. They could have missed uh, pages, blurred print. Um, so it's kind of hard sometimes to determine what you're getting. Um, I did select one title. I was really excited to even get a small number of copies um, because I wanted it in the collection. And it came and it didn't have the last page. <laughs> that was a little upsetting, um, to say the least. Um, we got one facsimile edition that was such a facsimile, it had all the ownership marks of the library that owned the original copy that they made the facsimile from. So we had to take care of that so that people wouldn't be kind and return it to the library that they thought owned it when in fact it was ours. Um, some requests take a, a good deal more time to research. So that's the challenge because you wanna give people good customer service, um, but sometimes the answer is not right now until I can explore this title a little more. Um, so those are, those are some of the biggest things besides the ebook um, whole thing of demand um, that I face in, in the things that I select. So Bethany, what about you? What's your biggest challenges? So one thing I run into a lot is um, popular materials for, for kids or teens being out of print. So they might have a lot of holds, but I simply cannot buy more copies. Um, for example, some of the older books in the Rainbow Magic Fairies series, um, Secrets of Droon you might be familiar with, um, or the Babysitter's Club books those those the um the regular print books were out of print um that one's an interesting case though because the babysitters club has had a really really popular graphic novel adaptation um and i i actually love them i never read the babysitters club um when i was when i was for you know at the right age for it but i've been reading the graphic novels as an adult and loving them um so though those graphic novels plus the netflix series um, of the Babysitter's Club have actually prompted reprints of the print books. So they're getting um, updated covers and they're slowly, you know, a few at a time being re-released. Um, so sometimes they do come back. So when, when that happens, it's, it's always a little celebration. Um, for me, the format and availability can also cause challenges, um, especially for digital materials. Certain things we just can't get. Um, they might be an Audible exclusive if it's e-audio. Um, I can't remember if we mentioned that already. Um, that can, can come into play. Um, and then for picture books, um, some of those are only available in certain formats like OverDrive Read or PDF format which doesn't really let you do a whole lot of, of adaptive resizing on your screen. So it's fine for computers or it's fine if you've got a larger tablet, but it can be pretty tricky to read on a phone screen. So those can be a little harder to make the decision because I know that it won't be as easy for everyone to use. So those are some of the ones that I, that I typically run into. Okay. Um, we're hitting a particular time, so let's stop uh, with some of the process questions uh, or discussion and move on to some of the really fun stuff, which is the new books. Um, but before we do that, uh, can each of us go ahead and say something about what our favorite part of the selecting job is? Um, Bethany, since you were just talking, um, I'll, let, I'll let you start off. 
Thanks. So absolutely, there, there, are, there are some challenges to this job, but there's so much fun as well. So for me, I've always loved stories, reading them, watching them, hearing them, whether it's a published work, a movie, or just anecdotes from friends. And it's truly a joy for me to see all of the stories that are being published now, especially with increasingly diverse representation. So Diane mentioned mirrors and windows, and I am always just delighted when I can find and provide stories that'll be mirrors for the lived experience of youth in Fairfax County, as well as windows for some other youth into different lives and different worlds. So that's, that's what I love the most about this job. Peggy. For me, I've always said that Reader's Advisory is my life and I'm not exaggerating. I just can't imagine doing something that I love more than, than what I do get to do every day. Um, I want our customers to find the books that they expect to find when they come in or look at in the catalog. But I especially want them to find the books that they didn't even know that they wanted to read or listen to until they discovered them in our, in our collection. As Bethany said, we're seeing more and more and more titles um, by diverse authors, own voices, types of things. And that's, it's so much fun to find those things and, and get them in, into the catalog, get them into Wowbury, and then have people say, oh my gosh, that sounds wonderful. I, I, I just can't enjoy, I couldn't imagine doing anything that I enjoy more. Yeah, I will, um, I will completely echo everything they've said. I barely need to add anything to that because I think it's the same reasons. Although I have a little more of a um, um, competitive, maybe I'm competing with myself. Um, but uh, it, when the awards lists and things come out, um, being able to spot uh, it's like, oh, how many of those did I, was I able to spot? How many, how many did I pick? And did I get enough copies? Um, you know, and so that to me, it's always kind of a, it's a, it's a Kaizen, it's a ever improving moment. So, you know, I always want to learn more and better about our community, uh, to be able to spot those things because I want that, um, I want that reward of happiness. When customers are happy, I get happy. Um, and so, you know, I'm always seeking that, 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 that kind of high, uh, if you will. Um, but it's a, it's a valid, you know, it's not a, it's not a, you know, a different, different kind. That's, that's my drug uh, is being right on these. Um, one thing that is really interesting, I don't know if y'all can see it, but this, uh, no, there, we go. This author, uh, this book is a poster for 40 Love by Olivia Dade. And this is one of the, um, this is one of, this is an independent author that we just kind of ran across. I ran across it in Twitter land and uh, she was from one of those diverse communities. And there is, it's, I basically went to Peggy and like, Peggy, Peggy, you got to get this, got to get this. And she bought some and it's been doing well. So I'm very excited about things like that because it's also introducing an author that may not have had a voice uh, previously. And I think libraries are a place where our customers can explore things that they might not want to experiment with on their own dime necessarily. But once they discover an author, they're gonna start adding that author into their collection personally. Uh, and so it's a, I love being a place of discovery for for readers and that goes with the readers advisory is my life i don't always have the best readers advisory skills but i can pick things and highlight them i love doing that with little micro histories as well things that people don't know they're interested in so anyway that's that's me um so in order to do the um upcoming books i'm gonna go ahead and share the screen, dun dun. Mm -hmm. And while yes. Diane does that, I'll just uh, let you know, we've each chosen a, a handful of books to highlight that we are really excited about and that we think customers will love. So I'll be getting us started with some children's and teen materials. And let's see, let me actually- Are you seeing it? I am seeing it. Okay, um, fantastic. Yep, I just need to pop out of full screen because it covered up my notes. 
Okay. Notes. Um, Who needs notes? Notes. What? Um, all right. So for for children and teens, um, the first book that uh, should be showing up momentarily is Folding Tech, Using Origami and Nature to Revolutionize Technology. So I've always loved origami, and this book goes into crazy incredible detail on the applications of folding technology in engineering and medicine. I was really fascinated by the photos and diagrams showing natural folding in flower buds and insect wings, and then how that kind of folding can be applied to techniques involved in things like NASA's newest largest telescope, a robotic gripper, and even a search and rescue robot. And then we've got Winter Keep. The Graceling series by Christian Kishore is one of my all-time favorite fantasy series. Uh, it's got an amazing mix of adventure, political intrigue, a dash of romance, all the good stuff. So I've just started reading Winter Keep, and it's the fourth book in the series, and it has really, really drawn me in so far. It's told from multiple perspectives, starting with that of a 13-tentacled sea monster. So that's, that's a pretty good hook, right? Um, the young Queen Bitterblue travels to the far more technologi technologically advanced country of Winterkeep, where two of her diplomats mysteriously vanished. With themes touching on environmental stewardship, political division, and the ways that parents can affect their children, this is a richly nuanced story and world. And then in JD and the Great Barber Battle, for some younger readers, JD is about to start third grade and his mom has just given him the worst haircut of his life. He takes matters and clippers into his own hands and discovers that he is seriously talented at cutting hair. When the local barber starts getting threatened by JD's growing customer base, the only way to settle matters is, of course, a barber battle. Authentic characters, humorous situations, and energetic cartoon illustrations will appear to young readers. So on the next slide, our last echoes. I will be completely honest, I'm excited for this book for others because I am not brave enough to read horror. Um, but that said, this book looks amazing. Sophia's mother disappeared 15 years ago from the Alaskan island of Bitter Rock where 31 residents also vanished without a trace in 1973. Sophia decides to investigate, but that turns out to involve fighting off demonic monsters and traveling through different dimensions. The atmospheric writing intertwines Sophia's narrative with transcriptions of audio and video recordings, promising tension, jump scares, and stay up all night intensity. So A Shot on the Arm from the Big Ideas That Changed the World series is by Don Brown, who's a master of nonfiction graphic novels. So I'm very much looking forward to this very timely topic in his series. So he starts by focusing on smallpox and concludes with the COVID-19 pandemic. Along the way, describing the science of immune systems, major figures in vaccine research, and public and political responses to vaccination through history. Um, the next one, How to Go Anywhere and Not, not Get Lost, um, actually from the same slide, thanks, Diane. Um, so humans have been navigating since prehistoric times, and this book covers historical navigation techniques using everything from the sun and stars, ocean swells, trees, and sand dunes, before it moves on to talking about satellites, radar, and GPS. So with adventures kind of limited these days, there are 17 activities in this book that'll provide a welcome escape for readers to get up and experience the principles and skills described in the text. Meg Medina's first novel about Mercy Suarez won the Newbery Medal, the highest honor in the US for children's writing. This sequel, Mercy Suarez Can't Dance, promises to deliver just as much heart and humor as the first. We see Mercy's struggles at school, having to live up to the expectations of teachers who knew her high achieving older brother, tangling with a bossy classmate and managing the school store with a boy she just might like. Meanwhile, at home, she's used to talking through her school troubles with her grandfather, Lolo, but with his Alzheimer's getting worse every day, who can help her make sense of things? This is a story of family, the many forms of love and learning to believe in yourself. In The Marvelous Mirza Girls, to cure her post-senior year slump, Noreen embarks on a gap year trip to New Delhi with her mother. With the help of kind, handsome Kabir, plus Bollywood celebrities, 14th century ruins, karaoke parties, and Sufi saints, Noreen discovers new meanings for home. 
But when a family scandal erupts, Noreen and Kaber must explore the boundaries of love and face what it means to truly stand by someone. In We All Play, Cree Metis author and illustrator Julie Flett um, celebrates imagination, diversity, and the interconnectedness of nature through an indigenous perspective, featuring playful birds who chase and chirp, bears who wiggle and wobble, owls who peek and peep, and children who shout, we play too, in English and in Cree. The Cree word for each animal is listed in the back matter. And I am so excited to see all of the illustrations of kids and animals from this award-winning author. Um, she's won many awards, including the American Indian Library Association Award. And my last two are the farthest out in terms of publication date, Six Crimson Cranes. The exiled Princess Shiori must unravel the curse that turned her six brothers into cranes, and she is assisted by her spur spurned betrothed, a capricious dragon, and a paper bird brought to life by her own magic. I will always love fairy tale retellings, and this one weaves threads of East Asian folklore with elements of the wild swans by Hans Christian Andersen to create a breathtakingly original fantasy. And I can't wait to get my hands on this one. And then in Change Sings, a children's anthem by Amanda Gorman. I've got a little far off highlight for you. This isn't out until September, but national youth poet Amanda Gorman dazzled at the inauguration and her debut picture book promises to do the same in a triumphant call to action for everyone to use their abilities to make a difference. And that is all I've got for you. Now we're on to Diane. Fantastic. Um, I'm going to get going on this. Uh, the first one I want to bring to your attention is Beginners, The Joy and Transformative Power of Lifelong Learning by Tom Vanderbilt. Uh, this one is already released. These release in these all three released in January. Uh, this particular book is for the lifelong learning community that we have here in Fairfax, um, or simply for those who have kept that childlike curiosity long into adulthood. Um, inspired by his daughter's need to know how to do just about anything, Tom Vanderbilt decided to spend a year learning um, a few new skills just for the sake of learning. And this book weaves research and insights from this year. Uh, he shows how anyone can begin again and why should they take those first awkward steps to do so. Uh, breathtaking, the power, fragility, and future of our extraordinary lungs. Uh, this one is by... Um, Michael J. Stephen, I'm attracted to micro topic books as I indicated earlier. So this one on the lungs caught my eye and it seems really topical. Um, pulmonologist Michael Stevens take us, Stephen takes us on a journey that sheds light into our extraordinary lungs. And it's a blend of science writing and medical reporting. It's detailed, but accessible, and it will engage anyone who's concerned with their respiratory health. Uh, aftershocks by Nadia Owusu. Now in this memoir, um, Whiting Award winner Owusu pens a deeply felt memoir about the push and pull of belonging, about the seismic emotional toll of family secrets and the heart that it takes to pull through. And uh, fair warning, I've, I'm reading that this is a heavy read. Um, I haven't been able to get my hands on it, but when I do, um, I know I'm going to have to kind of emotionally prepare myself to be in the right headspace to read it. Um, she she's a, an award winner. The Whiting Award is for emerging writers, so this is um, someone to keep an eye on. Uh, now, there are two true stories that read like best-selling fiction that are, are releasing in February. Uh, the first one is The Spy Master of Baghdad. It's the true story of bravery, family, and patriotism in the battle against ISIS by Margaret Coker. Um, the former New York Times bureau chief in, chief in Baghdad shows how ordinary Iraqis with little relevant training came together as covert intelligence unit called the Falcons, and they successfully infiltrated ISIS and helped to break its power and Three Ordinary Girls, the remarkable story of three Dutch teenagers who became spies, saboteurs, Nazi assassins, and World War II heroes. Um, this is a largely unknown story about three Dutch teenagers, um, Hanni Schaft and the sisters Freddie and Truus Overstegen. Uh, and it's an astonishing story of fearless resistors during occupy, excuse me, 
during World War II, whose youth and innocence belied their extraordinary daring uh, in the Nazi-occupied Netherlands. Uh, as was mentioned, I am a fan of podcasts and Useful Delusions, The Power and Paradox of the Self-Deceiving Brain uh, is by Shankar Vedantam, who is the NPR host of NPR's Hidden Brain podcast. And everyone agrees that lies and self-deception uh, can do terrible harm to our lives, to our communities, and even to our planet. Um, but in Useful Delu Delusions, Vedantam argues that paradoxically, sometimes deceiving ourselves and others can also play a vital human role, excuse me, a vital role in human success and our well-being. And Peggy mentioned um, the current news um, creating fiction. Well, here's a nonfiction book that I think everybody should take a look at, and it's by Walter Isaacson, who is a very heavy hitter, uh, as is Isabel Allende um, when it comes to writing. Um, Code Breakers, Jennifer Dudna, Gene Editing, and the Future of the Human Race. Um, this book um, is the how on how the pioneering scientist uh, Dudna, along with her colleagues, uh, and rivals launched a revolution that can allow us to cure diseases and fend off viruses, including the coronavirus. Um, in and this is in book form. Um, Isaacson is the author of Steve Jobs and Leonardo da Vinci, um, and he returns with a gripping account of the invention that's known as CRISPR, which is an easy-to-use tool that can edit DNA. And that invention, with its good and bad possibilities and its ethical dilemmas can easily launch a thousand thrillers, science fiction or dystopian fiction, or maybe even utopian fiction, here's hoping. Um, the next one I wanna talk about is Soul of a Woman by Isabel Allende. Um, Allende is best known um, for her works of fiction, House of Spirits, Of Love and Shadows, um, and she has, in, she has said previously that she became a feminist in kindergarten, and now she's bringing us essays that consider what it takes to satisfy the soul of a woman today, um, from feeling safe to having controls over one, one's body and one's life. Uh, so this is a really interesting one. Um, back to some micro history. Um, the award-winning and best-selling author of Cod brings us the unreasonable virtue of fly fishing. Um, so Mark Kolansky, um, this is an irres irresistible story of the science and art of the least efficient way to catch a fish. Um, he posits that fly fishing is a battle of wits between the fly fisher and the fish, and the fly fisherman does not always win. Um, it's a blending of history, craft, personal memoir, and it's going to show readers, whether or not they're a devotee of um, fishing or not, um, some of the necessity of experiencing nature's balm firsthand. Uh, Broken, which releases in April, uh, Broken in the Best Possible Way by Jenny Lawson. Lawson is a humorist who is known uh, for her great candor in sharing her struggle with mental illness um, in her previous book, Furiously Happy. And now she's exploring the experimental treatment of transcranial magnetic stimulation. Say that three times fast. Um, and she's doing it with brutal honesty as well as brutal humor. Um, Buses Are a Coming, a memoir of a freedom writer by Charles Person um, with Richard Rooker. That also releases in April. At 18, Charles Person was the youngest of the original freedom writers and who set out to discover whether America would abide by the Supreme Court decision that ruled segregation was unconstitutional. And they found their answer, no. Um, one bus was burned to a shell uh, and the second in which Charles rode uh, was set upon by a mob that basically beat the riders nearly to death. Buses Are a Coming provides a front row view to the struggle to belong in America. But more than that, it's a challenge from a teenager from one generation to the teenagers of another generation um, to become agents of transformation, to stand firm, firm, and to create a more just and a moral country where students have a voice, where youth can make a difference, and where everyone belongs. And the last one I'm going to mention is the woman they cannot, cannot, blah, the woman 
They Could Not Silence by Kate Moore. This is releasing in June. Um, and it's from the author of Radium Girls. Uh, and this is the true story of Elizabeth Packard, who was committed to an insane asylum by her husband in 1860, and she spent years fighting to free herself, as well as other sane inmates, um, and to effect lasting change in um, asylums. So this is one I think that um, should not be missed. And with that, I will move on to Peggy. The Survivors by Jane Harper. Uh, Karen Elliott's life changed forever on the day a reckless mistake led to devastating consequences. When a body is discovered on the beach, long held secrets threaten to emerge. Jane Harper's really an up and comer. She, each book does better than the one before. So take a look at that one. Restoration of Celia Fairchild by Bostwick. Um, I read the reader's copy of this and I really like this book. Celia Fairchild, known as advanced advice columnist, Dear Calpurnia, has insights into everybody's problems except her own. Still bruised by the end of a marriage she thought was her last chance to create a family, Celia throws herself into pro proving she is perfect adoptive mother material only to lose her job. Her one option, sell the Charleston house led to her by her recently departed estranged Aunt Calpurnia. Um, the postscript murders, I also read a reader's copy of that and really liked it. Um, and you'll see why. The death of a 90 year old woman with a heart condition should not be suspicious. Detective Carr certainly sees nothing out of the ordinary when Peggy's caretaker, that's why I liked it, um, begins to recount Peggy Smith's passing. But Montalka has a reason to be at the police station. While clearing out Peggy's flat, she noticed an un unusual number of crime novels all dedicated to Peggy. And each site psychological thriller included a mysterious postscript, PS for PS. Next. The Lost Apothecary um, by uh, Sarah Penner. Hidden in the depths of 18th century London, a secret apothecary shop caters to an unusual kind of kind of clientele, sorry. Um, women across the city whisper of a mysterious figure named Nella who sells well-disguised potions to use against the oppressive men in their lives. But the apothecary's fate is jeopardized when her newest patron, a precocious 12-year-old, makes a fatal mistake, sparking a string of consequences that echo through the centuries. Clara and the Sun, the first novel by Ishigora since he was awarded the National Prize in Literature, tells the story of Clara, an artificial friend with an outstanding observational qualities who from her place in the store carefully watches the behavior of those who come in to browse and of those who pass on the street outside. Clara and the Sun is a thrilling book that offers a look at our changing world through the eyes of an unforgettable narrator and one that explores the fundamental question, what does it mean to love? The Committed by Nguyen follows the unnamed sympathizer, um, I'm sure you all recognize that title, as he arrives in Paris in the early 1980s with his blood brother Bon. The pair try to overcome their pasts and ensure their futures by engaging in capitalism in one of its purest forms, drug dealing. But the new life he is making has perils he has not foreseen. Next. This is going to be quite a departure for Lisa Scolini. Um, this is historical fiction. Elisabetta, Mark, Marco, and Sandro grow up as the best of friends despite their differences. Their friendship blossoms to love with both San, Sandro and Marco, hoping to win Elisabetta's heart. But in the autumn of 1937, with all of that begins to change as Mussolini asserts his power, aligning Italy's fascists with Hitler's Nazis and altering the very laws that govern Rome. Of woman and salt is getting a lot of attention. Uh, from 19th century cigar factories to present day detention centers from Cuba to Mexico, Gabriela Garcia's of Women and Salt is a kaleidoscope, kaleidoscopic portrait of betrayals, personal and political, self-inflicted and those done by others that have shaped the lives of extraordinary women. A haunting meditation on the choices of mothers, the legacy of the memories they carry and the tenacity of women who choose to tell their stories. The Dictionary of Lost Words, I'm excited about this one too. I, I wanna read this myself. Esme is born into a world of words. She spends her childhood in the scriptorum, a garden shed in Oxford where her father and a team of dedicated lexicographers are collecting words for the very first Oxford English Dictionary. 
As she grows up, Esme realizes that words and meanings related to women's and common folks' experiences often go unrecorded. And so she begins in earnest to search out words for her own dictionary, the Dictionary of Lost Words. The Souvenir Museum by Elizabeth McCracken. Um, I love Giant House. So this, I uh, was excited to see this. Written by an author whose first book was one of my favorites. This is a collection of stories in which the mysterious bonds of family are tested, transformed, fractured, and fortified. Stacey Abrams, um, yes, that Stacey Abrams, has written a, 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 I would consider kind of a mystery, kind of a thriller. Avery Keene, a brilliant young law clerk for the legendary Justice Howard Wynn, is doing her best to hold her life together, excelling in an arduous job with the court while also dealing with a troubled family. When the shocking news breaks that Justice Wynn, the cantankerous swing vote on many current high-profile cases, has slipped into a coma, Avery's life turns upside down. Avery discovers that Justice Wynn has been secretly researching one of the most controversial cases before the court. The Personal Librarian by Marie Benedict. Marie Benedict is also, her books are just doing crazy great. Um, this, is, this is another one that kind of strikes close to home, so to speak. In her 20s, Belle da Costa Green is hired by J.P. Morgan to curate a collection of rare manuscripts, books, and artwork for his newly built Pierpont Morgan Library. But Belle has a secret, one she must protect at all costs. She was born not Belle da Costa Green, but Belle Marion Greener. She's the daughter of Richard Greener, the first black graduate of Harvard and a well-known advocate for equality. Belle's complexion isn't dark because of her alleged Portuguese heritage that lets her pass as white. Her complexion is dark because she is African-American. Next. And this is kind of mean of me because these are, are not yet on order and coming out in September, but I had to share it with you because Colson Whitehead, again, is just off the charts with, with demand. Ray Carney was only slightly bent when it came to being crooked. To his customers and neighbors on 125th Street, Carney is an upstanding salesman of reasonably priced furniture, making a decent life for himself and his family. Few people know he descends from a line of uptown hoods and crooks, and that his facade of normalcy has more than a few cracks in it, cracks that are getting bigger all the time. And Sally Rooney, um, she's also one where um, television and movies um, create demand um, with normal people. Alice, a novelist, meets Felix who works in a warehouse and asks him if he'd like to travel to Rome with her. In Dublin, her best friend Eileen is getting over a breakup and slips back into flirting with Simon, a man she has known since childhood. Alex, Felix, Eileen, and Simon are still young, but life is catching up with them. Will they find a way to believe in a beautiful world? And that's it for me. Um, our time is pretty much up, but I'm willing to stay on a couple minutes to answer the couple of questions that are in um, the uh, chat, as well as if anyone has any, if, if that's okay with others, and we're able to do that, uh, Sharon, if we're able to do that. Right, well, she here otherwise, let's assume I'm just trying to find the uh, I was gonna say <laughs> she's not saying no, so we're just gonna bulldoze through. <laughs> right you have as much time as you want. Um, all right, so one of the questions um, is if you know a book is in a series, do you consider in advance whether you'll get every book in the series or do you wait and see how the first one does? Oh yes and yes. Um it, that's that's one thing I struggle with when people ask for titles in a series and for example I they've asked for book number 14 and we don't have one through 13 um, so that's something I really I really do struggle with I try and get in early on things for that very reason but um, it, numbers I, I adjust numbers um, I start with one number of number of copies and then I look and see how something is done and I go up and I go down. So I guess that's, it, that's okay an answer. Okay. Uh, Bethany, anything to add for you? Um, not too much. I, I, I do pretty much a, a similar thing. Um, okay. If I do buy the first book, I, I um, sort of 
hoping that it'll do really well and that that we will have a reason to buy the second book um you know generally there's there's enough people who've read a book that that i you know don't want to leave somebody hanging without the second book um but if it if it really doesn't perform too well or if the second book gets really poor reviews then then i might wait and see if somebody requests it and go from there yeah um, this kind of a follow on to that was, do we plan in advance um, for things that are, we know are going to be seri serialized, that are going to be in serial, that are going to be a series. Um, and I can say for nonfiction, we don't get very many series um, in the same way that fiction does, but every now and again, it'll be a volume one. And I know there's going to be three volumes of something and they're published two to three years apart. Um, I cannot put the other ones on order that far out. Uh, so it's basically reminders and, you know, little tips and tricks uh, for that type of longer term um, uh, volumatic writing, I guess. You, it's a serial monograph for a technical term. Um, Peggy? I, I was just going to say, I really appreciate um, suggested title, Reminders. People give me a lot of those, you know, you, you have books one through four, how about five um, kind of thing. And I really appreciate those because try as I might, um, things do slip past if, you know, if, especially if there's been quite a gap between one title to the next. Um, so please, if you, if you do follow a series and you see that, that some are missing, please don't hesitate to put in a suggested title. I really do appreciate those, especially science fiction. Those are sometimes so, so hard to follow. You, you never can quite tell what series they belong to. Okay. Um, another question that has come in, what are the demographics of the selecting team at FCPL? Um, I can begin the fielding on that one. The core team um, are, there's basically, I do it part-time um, and Dustin Boer takes the nonfiction uh, side. So what you're seeing, the three of us plus Dustin and Sylvia is not here. So four women, one gentleman plus um, all of our staff who provide the recommendations and um, we may be the final decision makers, but we truly take under advisement all kinds of um, information. And I think... Um, the, the distributed it, selection initiative? Yeah. Oh. And Oh yeah, one, two, three, gosh, that's another handful. So we have what's called the distributed selection initiative, which inside baseball, so I'm not gonna get too deep into it, but it allows, um, we have given a certain amount of money to certain people uh, in um, branch staff who are also providing input. And that helps to bring in more voices beyond the three of us, because as you can see, you know, not super highly diverse, uh, the three of us, um, you know, being women, being white, um, we are different ages. Um, Sylvia brings, uh, who does our Spanish selection, um, is, uh, brings another area of quality. Um, we have, so, I mean, there's a number of ways that we bring, um, diversity into our group, even though as course, our core team is not as, um, diverse as our community is not directly reflective. Um, I think those were all the questions that went unanswered that had gone into the chat. Um, it wasn't a question, but I really loved the, uh, the comment um, saying thank you that the person is happy about all the queer romance novels popping up recently. Oh, I missed um, that. Yay. It was, yeah, um, I agree. I've been I've been reading more romance during the pandemic because it is comfort food, um, and and a lot of the queer ones have been just delightful. Um, the, and 
Yeah. I was going to say there are a few um, authors that I follow on Twitter. I'm in the Romance Landia corner of Twitter, um, which has its ups and downs. But the one thing is they provide some really amazing recommendations um, and authors that we should be looking at. And, you know, I, I gather all of that up in their weekends where Peggy's like, why is she doing this? <laughs> I'm sure. But yeah, so thank you for that. Yeah, We've thank you. Wonderful I, suggestions yeah. uh, from people. And I really do appreciate that. Because as I said, I, I look everywhere I can think of. And there's, you know, a lot of websites that I follow um, for best of kinds of things. So um, again, customer suggestions are, are just priceless. Um, because we do want it to reflect the people who use our, our resources and our services. Absolutely. Um, mm -hmm. And that's one way they have a voice. And we are getting a number of thank you, thank yous. Uh, we appreciate we appreciate that. Um, glad thank you, you got here. something out of the presentation, uh, including some new fun titles. If anybody has any questions, feel free to unmute yourself. Otherwise, um, we can go ahead and wrap up. And I also enjoyed the request to to tell Nell, Peggy's cat, um, <laughs> that that our participant loves her. Oh, I'm we, sorry. I what can I say? She's she's aging. She's very vocal, and I I worried about how noisy she would be. So I was prepared. I was poised to mute. Um, but I, I think most people are kind enough to to understand. Nell's I also always, have a very vocal cat, and I just wanted. I, I love her. I just wanted her to know. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, I will be sure and tell her that she will appreciate it. Yep. We we all fill the librarian stereotype of cat ownership because um, it's the best, you know. Yeah. Mine mine is loud when he wants food. Uh, mine don't talk a lot. They simply um, knock things off of desks, including laptops and run across me while I'm presenting, which is why I came in instead of was teleworking today. So, <laughs> all right. Um, One more question. Yep, oh. go for it, Diane. Uh, when will the library accept donations? Uh, right now, um, we are having to um, quarantine all of our materials. Um, we are taking a look at uh, that the industry is taking a look at that um, as new studies are coming out and as things are, um, as the vaccine is coming out and, and things along that line. But I'll be honest, for the foreseeable future, uh, well, no, I can see a lot further than, than, than three to four months. So um, I would say at least for the next three to four months, you can expect that we would not be taking donations. Um, but after that, um, we'll be announcing, you know, whether or not we can so just keep an eye out but i really don't see us doing it for the net in the in the first quarter of the year yeah we for the physical donations we are still able to accept monetary donations um and we also have a um through the library foundation we periodically update an amazon wish list yep. that can be accessed and so that is basically a, a super easy way for folks to see what are some of the things that are um, usually those are high holds materials or um, you know in, in demand for some reason and you can buy through Amazon and it will ship directly to our um, receiving department and get put into the system yep. so, thank you all for the for the library love it's uh, it's been great to to have you all here we had somebody let us know they love libraries and librarians we, Thank we love you. our readers. <laughs> Thank you to Diane, Bethany, and Peggy, three of my favorite people. It was a pleasure. It was fun. Glad to do it. We love talking about this. <laughs> I had way more books, but they wouldn't let me share them all. All right. Bye, everyone. <laughs>